be going through today is just the minimum qualifications, just qualifying behaviors. Again, a lot of this is online. I'll also show everybody or anybody who needs kind of how to find this all online and to find our benefits and all that, because there's a lot of different benefits that we're not going to cover here, but we do provide all of our benefits. Again, it's public and you can go through and study it and look at it all. We go over disqualifying behaviors, of course, mar marijuana use. This is a big one in Colorado now. Uh, salary and benefits are also pretty fun. Application process, just the process itself. The testing process, training academy, just a little bit what you can expect if you are hired. And then the police training officer program, which is like the on the job training, training program. So for here, the minimum qualifications, um, these are just some of them. Again, we list everything online, but some of the big ones are you have to be 21 years old. You need to have not been convicted of a felony. And if it was a conviction when you're a juvenile, um, there's a little bit extra processes we have to go through and we have to kind of look at what the what had happened and kind of, well, I guess I'll, a short answer to a long issue is we really have to look into it and see what's going on. And you have to contact Colorado Post to kind of figure out uh, whether or not they'll accept you, your uh, application to be an officer. So Colorado Post is the Colorado kind of, I want to say bureau, but it's like the group that governs all officers within the state. So they set what the requirements are and what the training is for the entire state of Colorado to be a police officer. So they have the final say on who can be an officer. Uh, so no felony or misdemeanor domestic violence charges. Um, this includes convictions, deferred sentences, anything like that. Um, it doesn't mean that you've been charged and found innocent, anything like that. It's, it's a conviction. Even if you do a deferred sentence, you, at that point you've pled guilty to that conviction. So you can't be an officer. For us, this is kind of a big one I'm going to spend a little bit of time on is the 60 credit hours or the 30 credit hours. We have two programs, I guess. Our minimum really is 60 college credits, and it can be in any course of study. Uh, it doesn't have to be criminal justice related whatsoever. But as long as you have 60 college credit hours by the start of the academy, then you're good to go. Now, the 30 college credit hour program is what we call our alternative education program. And what that is, is we had CSU Global, Colorado State University Global Campus accreditate our academy. Um, so they went through and looked at our classes and our training. And after going through it all, they said they'd give us 30 college credits just for going through our academy. So what that did is it allowed us to be able to lower our 60 college credit minimum to that 30 college credit minimum. And if you enroll with CSU Global and you have 30 or more credits, once you graduate the academy, they give you another 30 credits for going through the academy and that brings you up past that 60. Now there's contact information for CSU Global online. If you, if you, need further information, please talk to me because I know that can be confusing. If you don't have 30 credits or you don't have 60 credits right now, you can still apply as long as you are able to get that 30 or that 60 college credits prior to the start date of the academy. It looks like we're going to be starting the academy in it's like September or October at this point. I'm, I'm not going to give you specific dates at this time because we're still kind of figuring out how things are going to go and the first of the year with finances are always interesting. So, but it should be September or October of 2021 will be the start date. Of course, you have to be able to legally work in the United States. You just need the paperwork. You don't have to be a citizen. Um, technically, as long as you've gone through and done all the paperwork to legally work in the United States, we don't sponsor anybody, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And I don't help with all that at all. Um, so you have to do that on your own. As far as military, the only thing that's a disqualifier uh, with military is if you were dishonorably discharged from the military. All other discharges we're good with. And then, of course, you need a valid driver's license. It does not need to be a Colorado license. As long as you have a valid driver license from whatever state you're at, 
we just need you to have a Colorado driver's license by the time you start the academy. So that start date of the academy, you have to have it switched over. When you're doing the application, you don't need a Colorado driver's license. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the disqualifying behaviors just because we have a web page that I feel does a pretty good job at hitting most of the most of the things. But I'll hit them really quick. So biographical, <clears throat> we're talking about more of like while you're going through the application, leaving out information about yourself that may you feel may look bad or you know, maybe there was a job that you got you know, told that you either leave or they're going to fire you kind of thing and you don't tell us about it. That's kind of what we're looking at here. So we can work through a lot of stuff. But as you know, as seen, as you've seen in, you know, the state of the community right now in the world, I guess, is honesty and integrity are extremely important uh, in a police officer. So if we're going through the application process and we find that you are not being honest or you're trying, and I emphasize trying, to omit information from us, then you will be instantly disqualified. Now, if you're going through and you forgot to put something and you tell us later, oh, shoot, I was laying in bed, you know, thinking about this stuff and I forgot to tell you that that's different. Um, please just let us know. We're not looking to disqualify you because you forgot something. Obviously, this is pertaining to like specific and intentional leaving out stuff because you feel it'll make yourself look bad. So please be honest, please be honest. We can get through a lot of things if you're honest with us. It's one of the biggest things if you take away um, from this meeting, that's one of the biggest things uh, you can do. Uh, another thing, if you're not honest, we find out that we're not honest, we disqualify you from this process. Uh, I'm gonna be honest with you, it's gonna be hard for you to become a police officer anywhere else because we all share information. The next time you apply to be an officer, you sign a paper saying that you can release your information and they call us and say, hey, why didn't this person make uh, a police officer with you? And we tell them, oh, because they were found to be lying on their application. So just be honest. Um, we can always work through that. Again, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but yeah. Financial, some of this stuff, it's not, you don't have to have perfect credit score you know, you don't have to have a, the best 401k or, or anything like that. Or uh, if you actually bounced a check or anything like that, it doesn't disqualify you from being an officer. Some of the things we do look at is like if you're trying to, like if you purposely wrote a check on an empty account, trying to get away, you know, with it, that's obviously something we're going to look at. As far as integrity, again, we kind of hit this a little bit when I was talking about the biographical. It's just being truthful. Um, if you um, have lied under oath for any reason, you know, that kind of stuff is what we're looking at there. Drugs, that pretty much goes without saying. Um, we do have a three-year uh, for hard drugs. So if you've used any sort of hard drugs, again, we don't expect people to be perfect. Uh, everybody's had those bad mistakes or stupid decisions they've made, but you cannot have used hard drugs of any kind in the last three years and then apply. Um, you have to have three years between that uh, and the application. Alcohol. This one is more of like drinking alcohol at work kind of things. Um, we're not saying you can't drink alcohol. You can have alcohol, that kind of stuff, but um, it's just making sure, like I said, you're doing it legally and ethically. Criminal behavior, again, we kind of hit on this a little bit. No domestic violence convictions, really no misdemeanor convictions in the last three years. Uh, again, if there's something that you think we should look at, we will. And we take that on a case by case basis, but pretty much most misdemeanor convictions in the last three years, um, you're going to have to wait until that you have three years between the time you apply and the time that that happened. Driving history. Uh, this one is a little more gray. Of course, like DUIs, DWIs, we have a three year on that as well. But some of the other things is we look at like driving behavior. So a good example for this is if you have one speeding ticket, that's not a big deal. 
but if you have a speeding ticket for going 100 over, then that's a big deal. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of using a little bit of common sense. If you've gotten three tickets over the last 10 years, you know, obviously that doesn't sound like a big deal. If you've gotten three tickets over the last three months, then obviously that is a big deal. Everybody else can still hear me, I'm hoping. I have somebody here saying they can't hear me. Okay, very good. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, awesome. Thanks, guys. I just want to make sure Agreed. I ate. <laughs> that, that'd be funny to be sitting here talking. And everybody's like, is he saying something? <laughs> and I'm halfway through the presentation. <laughs> yeah, we had that happen during our academy with the shift to COVID. We had an instructor talking for about really? 30 minutes before we realized <laughs> no one can hear. An hour. <laughs> yeah. See, that would be my luck with how things are going this week. <laughs> Okay, cool. All right, guys. Um, cool. So I, I hope that makes sense with driving history. Again, like I've had driving tickets. Uh, you know, I've been in an accident. We don't we don't expect you to be perfect, um, but you know, we do look at that history, and it's kind of like reasonable. Like, what do you think a reasonable person and you know mistakes and that kind of stuff? Certifications. This one again is more for. Uh, while you're going through the process, again, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. It's about not lying and be truthful. Um, so if you said you were honorably discharged from the military and you have a DD-214, um, we need to make sure we get that. Um, we've had people alter those things. Of course, that's automatic disqualifier because now you're kind of going into the integrity part as well. Or they say they have a certain amount of college credits and they alter their credits, that kind of stuff. So again, just be truthful. Don't alter things. <laughs> and it seems like a no duh kind of thing, but I'm telling you, I have stories. <laughs> I wouldn't put it on here if I didn't. Marijuana. Obviously, we're in Colorado, so this is something I have to confront quite often. Marijuana use, it is legal in this state, but it's still federally illegal. Uh, we still do not allow any city employees to use or participate in CBD or marijuana. As it says on the slide here, Amendment 64, which is the, the marijuana amendment, was not intended to require employers to uh, permit marijuana use. Um, so no marijuana or CBD oil use in the last 18 months. Again, we get people make mistakes. We get like things have happened when you're young and dumb, quote unquote. We get that it's uh, a little more accepted now throughout the country, but we still have a no marijuana use policy. But we also do that 18 months again because we are we know that people uh you know have bad times in their life and can learn from that and be a really good officer because of those times in their life so again 18 months by the start date of the uh, application so the 26th now we're on to the fun stuff salary and benefits so as a recruit and when i say recruit that's as you're going through the academy, you are getting $27.23 an hour. So $27.23, which is $56,640 a year. So we're actually paying you to go through schooling, which is pretty good because that's a lot. A lot of people don't make that and they're not getting uh, an amazing education. So as you're going through, you're a full city employee with city benefits. Uh, the benefits come into effect the first full month that you are there. So if you start the academy on the 4th of July, August 1st would be when your benefits come in. And of course the benefits are what you select. And again, we'll kind of, I'll kind of show you where all of our benefit information is online if I can figure out how to do so. <laughs> Uh, okay, so anyway, then you go to this P4, uh, P4 is police officer fourth class. That is the moment you graduate, you automatically bump up to that. So you go from the 27.23 an hour to the 29.93 an hour, which is the $62,244 a year. That's automatic just for graduating the academy. Then every year on your graduation date from the academy, you bump up to the next level. So the next year you go up to that P3 police officer third class, and that's the $68,604 a year or $32.98 an hour. Uh, the next year is the $75,588 at $36.34 an hour. And then the year after that, your final kind of automatic 
bump is 86,652 or the 4166 an hour. Now, any laterals in here, you come in and you start the academy at that lateral rate, which is the $36.34 an hour. And you are automatically higher seniority than a recruit. So you come in, you still go through the entire academy. We'll talk a little bit about that. You're in competition only with the other laterals in your class. So you guys are already kind of above just the normal recruits as far, just as far as the seniority goes. And, and of course, you're starting a little higher in pay. And all that is on our website again, if you want to go back through and, and look at it. All right. So as we continue on, application process. One of the big reasons I do this presentation that you guys are all so kind to have attended is that it's a little different than any other job. Um, it's not resume based. It's not really uh, a typical interview based job. It's actually more of a testing based job. So we obviously we have applications open right now. We're keeping them open through December 21st. I highly suggest that if you are at all interested, uh, apply well before that date. We do say we can close the applications at any time. We haven't done that yet. Obviously, if you want to apply, we want you to apply. But on that date, on December 21st, we close them and we do not reopen them for any reason. So if something happens and you're not able to get your application in because your computer decided to go for a run or whatever, that's on you. Shouldn't have waited to the last minute. So please, 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 if you're at all interested, put the application in, you can apply. And then if something comes up and you have to pull your application, and you're no longer interested, you're going to a different department, whatever it is, just let us know is all we ask. Just let us know. We'll pull your applications and you're more than welcome to apply the next time we do it. Again, it looks like we're going to do an academy in September or October. This date has changed a few times, so I usually I don't say a date because <clears throat> it's gone from the 4th to the 20th. Just be aware that that date is not set in stone. Okay, so after you put in your application within 24 to 48 business days, you should get an email stating whether or not your application was accepted or rejected. If your application is rejected, you'll get kind of a generic email saying it's been rejected and you need to look over your application and the minimum qualifications. And basically it's telling you to look over and, and figure out why you were rejected. If you have, like if there was a weird situation, like your license was suspended for a week because you were in the hospital and you couldn't pay a ticket, you know, something that like actually makes sense. We have a process to where you can write us back and in that email, you'll get the instructions on how to do so. And you can explain the situation. We then look at that and uh, if we need to, we take it to the chief and he goes, yep, I'm good with that. And we move you on into process and we accept your application. So that's kind of one of those, those trip falls you have to get past if there's kind of one of those weird stories. Still answer truthfully on the application. Don't freak out if your application is rejected. We'll work with you. We'll tell you what's going on and we'll see if we can get you get your application accepted. Now, if it's something like, yeah, I smoked marijuana last week, then don't expect us to accept that. Most of you, I'm, I'm sure, will get a, a letter that says, or an email that says you've been accepted, your application's been accepted. What the next process is, is this written test. We are actually changing it this year. So if you've gone through the process before, it's going to be a little bit different. We used to have everybody come here to Colorado Springs to the police operations center downtown. And we had a computer lab and you'd come and we'd proctor a written test. We are working with that host, the test provider right now to make it all digital. So when we, when we get this all set up, we're pretty much done, but again, we're kind of still working with the provider. It should be in the end of November, beginning of December. Everybody whose application has been accepted, we're gonna send out the information on how to test. Um, we'll probably give you a certain amount of time, like a week to complete the test. Uh, and then you can go and do that test on your own. There'll be a link. You sign up, you go through and you do the test. So you could do it at one in the morning at your house now, instead of having to travel here to Colorado Springs to complete. 
again, this eliminated one of the times of coming here and being in person. So for those of you that are out of state, this should help you out a little bit as far as, you know, the expenses <laughs> of coming down here. Helps yeah. Lot. Yeah. So we've been trying to do this for a while. Obviously, it, it's a, uh, it's a big, it's been a big undertaking, but I really think it's going to work out well. So, so that's really cool. I'm super excited, but the downside is again, it's going to take us until November or December to start that testing process. So just bear with us a little bit. The test itself. Now you don't have to be a police officer or a criminal justice major or anything like that to do well on this test. It has nothing to do um, with your knowledge of policing. It measures on, quite honestly, if you're going to be able to be a good police officer, if you're going to be able to learn this skill. So we look at like reading, writing, arithmetic, grammar, um, situational ethics, those kind of things. And most of it's going to be, you know, like mathematics is pretty, it's the simpler kind of word problems, trying to figure things out, uh, you know, patterns. And, you know, you have a bunch of people doing a crime at this time and these dates, you know, what, what would you think the next crime might happen? You know, those kind of things, just normal, logical thinking. We will provide uh, a real short couple question, like study guide. And then the vendor we're using also provides a study guide that you can purchase. I would highly suggest that you purchase it, but again, it's not required but at least it'll help you know the kind of questions that are gonna be asked and will help you prepare uh, for that test. So, and again, we'll send you all that information to everybody whose applications have been accepted. Now the written test is 30% of your entrance exam score. The other 70% is the oral board. And um, I'm probably next time gonna change this slide because it's really not a board per se anymore and it kind of well it is a board but it, it's let me explain <laughs> i'm getting ahead of myself so it's more like a recording um literally so we use this application it's actually kind of cool it's called spark hire and how it works is when you're ready to do your oral board so let's say you did the written test you must get a 70 or higher on that test to move on and so you completed your written test in december we write you and tell you you've been ex you've passed the test and we give you the instructions on how to go on to the spark hire interview when you do it again you do not have to come to colorado springs because it's all online and again it's more like a recording what it is is an application we load the questions into you click start and it gives you the question usually gives you we'll probably give you about a minute to kind of get your thoughts together take notes real quick, and then you have to hit record and it'll record your answer. So it's like you're in an interview, but there's nobody on the other side staring back at you or asking you follow-up questions. So you answer your questions. When you're done, you hit stop recording, and then it goes on to the next question. Once it's done, it submits it all to us. We do have a, a board of officers that go through all the interviews, and then they rate them. That interview process is 70% of your score. So we combine the, that along with your written test and that's your entrance exam score. Yeah, that again, that interview can be weird. What I suggest, since you guys are all here, I'll give you some of my tips. Uh, have somebody write questions on a, like a card or a piece of paper that you aren't aware what the questions are. Set up a phone or a camera and have them slide you the questions even have a stopwatch if you want or answer them as quickly as you can and then go back and review it that'll help you with your just overall interview score uh skills and can help you a lot with this this interview portion because it is it's different you've probably never done it like this before even if you're a previous officer because it's kind of new after those scores are combined we usually take about three times as many people as we have positions for into the background process. What I mean by that is if we're going to hire 50 for the academy, I'm going to take 150 people and I'm going to move them into backgrounds. And that's strictly based on that score. 
no interview, no history, no anything else. Um, it's just based on that score. We move those into backgrounds, and then that's where some of these slides are coming into play. We, so what I mean by this banding and employment list is we put all of your scores, let's just say from like 90 to 100, that'll be A band. And then 80 to 90 will be B band. Obviously, that's a big band. We usually do it a little less than that, but, and then we'll move. So if we're looking for 150 people, we might take A and B band and move them into the background process. Um, so it's just a way of getting to that two thirds, uh, or sorry, three times as many people as we need um, into the background process. Then we do like this personal history questionnaire. Uh, any military people have kind of done something similar to this. It's equivalent to like a top secret clearance. It took me like two weeks to get all the information to fill out this 50 page like questionnaire of all the places I'd lived and I was prior military well as well. So I was trying to remember all these different areas and people and, you know, uh, supervisors and all that. It took me quite a bit to fill out, but that's what that is. It's just giving us information for the background. Um, kind of process of it. Um, so that takes a little bit. We send you the packet, you fill that out and you send it back to us. Again, all of that, a lot of it's going digital. So you don't need to come here, you don't need to drop it off, anything like that. This is also the part where we're looking to get those documents I kind of mentioned, um, your, yeah, your official military personnel file, transcripts, driver's license, social security card, birth certificates. It's all those kind of marriage licenses. It's all that kind of stuff we get uh, and put it in your file with that, that background investigation. And this is, again, where we do the polygraph. Um, we do a polygraph. I know I get uh, questions about this quite often. If you fail the polygraph, it doesn't mean you're automatically out. We know there's issues and that a polygraph isn't 100%. We do have very, we have full-time polygraph examiner, examiners, I think they're called polygraphers. Yeah, awesome. Um, and they're really good. But if you've been honest with everything, it's not a big deal. And again, we sometimes you, you might have a, a question that is, uh, I forget what their term is, it's like, um, possible, whatever. Um, what that does is it just gives us an area to kind of look through and make sure that we've gotten all the information and that you indeed are being truthful. Again, if you have an issue with one of the questions in the polygraph, we're going to work through it. It's not an automatic disqualifier. We're not like, see, you failed the polygraph. Okay. So don't freak out about it. Again, as long as you're honest, telling us everything, you're going to, you're going to be fine. This is, that isn't a part where we lose a ton of people, um, I guess is what I'm trying to say. We just use it as a, a supplemental tool. The physical ability test, and we're going to go into this a little bit more detailed in the next slide. But again, we're going to start this, and we're only going to administer it to those who've been asked to move on in the process. Um, so it's going to be during that background process. You are going to be asked to come to Colorado Springs for this part. Again, you will already know that you're, you know, pretty far into the process. So we're hoping it's a little more incentive to come here. But at some point, we have to do that in-person polygraph. We have to do an in-person interview, background interview. Um, we do the 16PF and the uh, MMPI, which are like psychological tests, um, national tests. We didn't make them up. You have an interview with a psychologist, and then we administer that PAT test. After everything's done, we kind of put everything into your packet. Then you go into the selection committee, and that's usually based up of like the chiefs and the deputy chiefs and head of human resources. And they go into their top secret squirrel meeting area behind, you know, uh, closed doors and they come out and they have the people they want to hire. Um, I don't know how that works. I've never been invited to be in there, but they go in and then what we do is we send out the final offers. So uh, it looks like we're going to be looking to hire 70 people um, for that September, uh, October class. 
So we would send final offers to 70 people. And then usually we have three to five that are kind of on a standby list. Uh, and we try to be, again, extremely open with you and let you know what's going on. We also try to make sure we do that two months or longer prior to the start day of the academy. We know that there's people, like you guys were saying, from all over the country. And quite honestly, we have people from all over the world uh, that apply. So um, we try to give those two months. So you have time to you know, move or shore up what you need to with your current job, your family, all that kind of stuff. So we try to give you that. Now, if you're on that uh, standby list, we might not be able to do that as much. We're still going to tell you that you're on the standby list, but we've had people uh, like the day of the academy call us and say they're not going to come um, for whatever reason. We will call you on that standby list and say, hey, you want to come to the academy? Be here as soon as you can. So just because you're on that standby list doesn't mean you're not going to make it. So just something to keep in mind. Let me move on here. Okay, <clears throat> physical ability tests. This, this is right here, the slide that I have here. Hopefully most people can see it, but this is the minimum you have to do to be able to um, show up at the academy to, to get through that background process and, and get your packet into the hiring committee. These are the minimums. You must pass every single one of these. If you do not pass one of them, you don't pass any of the tests. It's a pass or fail, okay? Vertical jump, you get three attempts to get 15 inches. Uh, I have all the videos online, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time explaining it. Uh, if you have a question or you can't find the videos, please let me know. Um, you can also go on our YouTube channel. I've posted them on there. And I think we did an okay job, even though they're kind of boring videos. But hopefully it has the, the information you need to, to make it successful for this. Bench press is 60% of your body weight. That kind of goes... Uh, there's not a whole lot I can explain about it. It's a normal bench press. And then you can calculate 60% of your current body weight or your body weight when you take the test. The Illinois Agility Test, um, this is a national test. So if you have further questions about how it's set up, you can literally Google Illinois Agility and you'll see all these things come up about it. You get two attempts to do 22.2 seconds. It's kind of, it's a 10 meter run so it's not very far you run down 10 meters you run around a cone you come back and then there's some cones like set up and you kind of serpentine in between the cones and then serpentine back and then run back the 10 meters and then back through and you have to do that within um 22.2 seconds and again we have videos online we have it on our web page and we have it on youtube sit-ups uh, you have to you have one attempt to do 25 correct sit-ups uh, again, we explain how we do a sit up online. It's a normal sit up. You have somebody holding your feet and you have to do 25 correct. 300 meter run, you have one attempt to do it within 76 seconds. Uh, and then push ups, you have one attempt to do 19 correct push ups. And the beep test, this is another one I get a lot of questions about. Um, we've explained it on again on a video, and it is kind of a national test that you can look up quite a bit of information. It's 20 meters, 20 meters. Yeah, 20 meters. And you have to run back and there's like a there's like this audio track that has literally beeps. And you have to make it to the line, the 20 meter line before the beep or as the beep sounds and then go back and the beep slowly get faster. And that's how it levels up. Um, each level is a little bit faster. So you have to get to 4.4. Again, I know that can be confusing if you've never heard of it please watch it on our page or YouTube, or again, you can, you can uh, Google it. Or you can contact me too, and I'll, I'll try to help you out. So you have gotten the final offer and you show up at the Academy. Congratulations, yay! Uh, approximately 26, it's almost, to be honest, it's probably gonna be more like 27 weeks now. COVID has kind of <laughs> made it a little more difficult and we are hiring more people. Uh, which is awesome for you, but it might add uh, a week or two to that academy length. You are paid. Again, I kind of went over this uh, $27 an hour as you're going through if you're a police recruit. You go home night and weekends. It's not a live-in academy. You don't have to leave your family. You're not staying in dorms, anything like that. 
I always say it's an adult-based learning environment. You act like an adult, we treat you like an adult. So that being said, you you go home. We don't help you with housing, uh, any of that. It's completely up to you to figure out. You you live with your family, or if you um, have a bunch of, of other recruits that rent a place together, whatever it is, that's entirely up to you. Again, we talked about benefits. It is a, so what I mean by closed academy, there's not, we don't have a bunch, it's not a regional or anything like that. We don't have a bunch of people from all over the area coming to our academy. Um, people can't pay to come to our academy. So everybody in our academy, for the most part, is this is going to be co workers of yours. As long as they graduate, you guys all have jobs, you go out and you start working for CSPD. The reason I said for the most part is sometimes we'll have like, um, a courtesy where we'll allow one or two people in from a neighboring agency because something's happened. Obviously, we work really well with neighbor agencies. We have good relationships with them. So that has happened before where we have a few from, from other agencies. But for the most part, it's just people that you'll be working for and that we have hired through this process. And I'm not sure if I actually have mentioned this, but it's a Monday through Friday kind of thing. We give you the schedule of the academy, like the second day of the academy. So you have the whole schedule for that whole the whole time you're there. Because we know it's difficult for children and child care and that kind of stuff. Most of the time it's a Monday through Friday, like 7.30 to 16.30 kind of thing. We do some swing shifts and we do some nighttime training. But again, that's an exception and not the norm. But you have to do some training for driving at night, shooting at night. We do scenarios at night. So there are times that that happens. Again, we try to prepare you for that so you can take care of child care, or, you know, families and that kind of thing. Again, once the academy is over, so that's 16, 30 hours, you're, you, you just go home. It's like a normal job. Yeah, the academy is a, a physical academy. They do a lot of fitness. So just be prepared for that. I always tell people that you can't prepare a whole lot for the academy um, as far as like studying. And I mean, there's some things you can do, but a lot of it, you don't know what they're going to ask and how the test is going to be. Um, so that's going to be something you prepare while you're at the academy. But fitness is something that you can prepare beforehand. And if you're physically ready for the academy, that's one less thing you're going to have to worry about while you're going through. For example, I was lucky enough to come out of the, the military and right into the academy. Military had kept me fit. So the fitness part of the academy was actually fun for me. It wasn't something uh, I was worried about. It wasn't another stressor. It was actually something that helped me de-stress from everything going on in the academy. Although there were some people in my academy that that wasn't the case for them. And the fitness part was another stressor piled on. So if I could give you some advice, it's to please be ready physically for that academy. It'll make it a much more enjoyable experience for you. Okay, so this is just some of the academy, just real quick on the academy, some of the stuff they go through. So these are all skills. Again, I kind of talked about post. That's police officer standard uh, standards and training. Um, we're governed by that, the Colorado Post. They kind of set what we have to do. So for firearms, the reason there's two numbers there is post requires 72 hours. We actually do 120 hours. Um, so we do a lot more than what the minimum requirements are for just about everything in post. And that's why we have one of the longer academies. We do a lot of training. Uh, and that's why we feel we're one of the best departments in the, in the nation. So for the firearms, we do use the MMP 2.09 millimeter. This isn't something you have to purchase. You are issued this gun. We also issue an AR-15 uh, rifle to you. Usually we use the Smith & Wessons. Uh, and then every car has the 12 gauge shotgun that is not issued to you. It's just in, in the vehicles. We also have lots of less lethal devices. A lot of those require special training uh, and classes that we will send you to. But then we also have the taser as well and everybody has their own taser. For arrest control, again, post requires 62 hours. We do 102 hours. Uh, again, that's more like the defensive tactics um, kind of thing. Driving, post requires 44 hours. We do 47 hours. And then the reality-based training isn't required at all by post, and we do close to 90 hours. What I mean by reality-based training, just in case somebody doesn't know, is it's scenarios. 
So we have actors come in and act like they're in a domestic violence or they're breaking into a car or something like that. And then you as a training officer go and try to work through that call as if you were actually out in the street. It's really cool. Um, you learn a lot of information. It can be a little stressful, but it's, it's really a great way of kind of, I don't know, emphasizing some of the stuff you've learned in the academy. Okay. Also, while we're going through, our department is very um, family oriented. Uh, they care a lot about you as a person. And so while you're going through academy, one of the things they do is what we call the family academy. They usually meet once or twice a month. And this is where you can bring your whole family, your extended family, your parents, your kids a lot of times. Sometimes you can't, depends on what they're doing. But we'll have like canine come and, and talk to you guys. We'll have officers come and, and officer wives or spouses come and talk to you about what it's like or talk to your, your wife or your spouse or your husband about what it's like to be an officer spouse. So we're really trying to work and help families while we're going through. And this is while you're going through the academy, kind of helps families work through the challenges of being an officer. Because some of that, I mean, officers work 24 hours a day, right? So there's different shifts and sometimes, <clears throat> you know, something big will happen and the, your officer won't be able to get in contact with it you right away and so it also helps kind of set up that network and you, you become friends like uh, my wife still has friends from going through this family academy 15 years ago so it's it's a really cool support system and again it says right here you meet the chief a lot of times we do firearms we 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 have everybody go down to the range they all shoot the guns panel discussions talk about tours and facilities all that kind of stuff so it's just kind of familiarization PTL, police training, this is kind of like on-the-job training. Yeah, I think on-the-job training is the easiest way. A lot, of, a lot of laterals, it's PTO, FTO, it's very similar. But what happens is the moment you graduate the academy, you take that post-test. It's usually one of the last weeks of the academy as long as you pass the post-test, which is kind of like, I mean, the, the knowledge of everything you've learned in the academy. Um, and we train you really well. I can't remember a time where somebody's failed that test because we train you much further than that. Again, like we've said, but once you pass the post test, go to graduation. Again, we hire the amount of people we hope that will be on, will make it through the academy and be on patrol. So, if we're hiring seventy, or we want seventy on on patrol, we hire seventy. We hope all seventy make it through. So, as long as you graduate the academy, you have a job with us. And usually you start a day to three days after your graduation date, and you go out and you ride with a training officer. So that PTO phase, police training officer phase, is 15 weeks long. <clears throat> the first week is kind of a ghost phase where you're following that officer. They're giving you tips. They're showing you, you know, some of the programs, how to write, um, how to get around, navigate, how to talk to people, that kind of stuff. Then there's a, a six-week like training period um, and then a midterm where you switch from one officer and another and that officer evaluates if you are where you need to be halfway through the program as long as you they say yep you're good to go then you go to usually a different shift with a different officer you need to do another six weeks and then you have a final evaluation with another officer and that final evaluation they just make sure you're where you need to be at the end of the program Okay, and for laterals, that can be shortened quite a bit. They can, they can make that quite a bit shorter, so don't think you have to do a real long PTO phase if you're a lateral. Retirement. So, again, uh, everybody's interested in benefits, which is awesome. We have great benefits. The issue with presenting benefits is uh, I could be here for the next three hours going over the different things we have. So, I'm just going to refer a lot of this to you guys to go on to our web page and to go through and see what our benefits are and, and hopefully it, it's good for you. Of course, it's a, a government organization. I think the benefits are great. So, I mean, I, so I just basically I went through and found some of my the big kind of pluses about the, the agency's benefits and put them in here for you. So retirement, 
his 25 years of service and age 55. So this is full retirement. 2% benefit per year for the first 10 years and then 2.5 uh, for every year after that. So what that means is like the percentage uh, and it's based on the highest three years um, before you before you uh, you retire. So if you did 10 years, you'd get that 2% a year. So you'd, at, you'd be at 20% retirement. Then obviously after the 10 years, it moves up to the 2.5%. So after that 20, let's say you did another 10 years, you're getting 25% more on that. So you can kind of calculate and they have all those online with the actual monetary amount. You are vested after five years. So if you put in five years with us, uh, you are vested, you're getting that retirement. So here we talk about the employee contribution is 11%, the employer is 8%, vacation we get 3.69 days per pay period every two weeks, uh, and you max out at 264 hours, meaning if you don't use and you go over that, um, then you lose it. So just make sure you use it. Six, you get 9.33 hours a month. Again, the max out is 1,056 hours. So not only do you get this vacation and this sick, uh, but the city, because you're an officer and you're gonna possibly work holidays, at the very beginning of the year, they give you 88 hours of vacation for those because there's technically 88 government holidays, 88 hours of government holidays throughout the year. Um, so they give you that as vacation. So even if you don't work Christmas, so if Christmas falls on one of your days off, you still get that 88 hours of vacation a year as a benefit. Really what it comes down to is most officers take anywhere from three to four weeks off a year. So you're almost getting a month off of paid vacation a year. So it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. And of course we have medical, dental, vision, education assistance, life insurance. We have all that kind of stuff. Again, you can go on and look how much it is <clears throat> because it depends on how much you pay. We have kind of a more risky one where you pay less a month, but then the deductible is a little higher. And then we have a less risky one where you pay more a month, but your deductible is a little lower. Again, all that is public. So CSOs, I always throw this in here because um, sometimes people are really interested in this program. It's actually a very popular program. What they are is they're non-sworn, and, and I don't mean this in any sort of derogatory term, but they're they're like the officers' helpers. They do they work right alongside our officers. They uh, like I used to be an accident investigator, so they would come out and they would uh, help me, you know, run back and forth between the cars and and give paperwork out or help direct traffic while I'm doing the investigation. So they do a lot of those kind of things. They assist with property crimes where there's no suspect information, so they'll start getting the report. They do teach classes. They they do a bunch of different things for us. But whenever an officer needs help, a lot of times we call for one of one of these individuals to come help us out. Um, it's a great way for a young person who maybe still wants to be going to college because again, it's part time, 29 hours a week. But they get crazy cool experiences. They working with officers, getting FaceTime with the officers. It's just a great program. It is becoming uh, competitive. We have a lot of people really interested in this program. I can't tell you when these positions open because it's all based on need. Usually after I run an academy, I open because I get a lot of CSOs who have applied after finishing college or whatever and they make it into the police academy. But if you're interested, there's some information on that on our webpage. This is just a little more information of training to be a CSO. Kind of goes through, you know, interviewing skills, the CRS, which is like the laws, um, CPR, crime scene processing, the MDC, MFR. Those are just programs we use and how you're dispatched and given information on the road through the computer. We do driving and they do defensive tactics. And um, then there's the field training, which is kind of like the PTO, FTO, where you go and you, you ride with a, another CSO officer for a while. This is just some information about what all they do. So um, 25,000 to 29,000 calls uh, a year is what, what they cover. 6,000 reports, six to 8,000 reports. Uh, 2,700 to 3,200 traffic accidents. Oops, 
This is so they do a lot of abandoned vehicles, parking complaint calls. So this is just showing how much they get to do and how much impact they are for us. Just in case you were interested, the caps program. I throw this in here. Um, this is how we do our internships. Uh, if you're in college and you're looking to get an internship, you have to do it through the caps program. Fortunately, with COVID, a lot of this stuff has, has been paused because um, um, they're all volunteers, all considered a volunteer. But this is, yeah, if you are at all interested or if a family member is at all interested, we have a really active volunteer program, um, or we did before COVID. But here's some of the information for you. I don't want to hit talk too long. I think I'm talking too much already. So just in case, again, anybody's interested, sometimes people forget that there is somebody on the other side of the telephone answering calls and talking to the officers. So our communication center is right here. It's actually within 15 feet of where I'm sitting right now. They do all the calls for the city. We have call takers and dispatchers. We have the fire department up there and we have the ambulance up there. They're all within this, this same area. If you are interested or anybody you know is interested, a lot of times we have spouses that are really interested in this. We have applications open right now and we keep them open. After we receive uh, enough applications, we then process it um, and then start hiring and put a, a class on for, for the 911 call takers and the dispatchers. So I wanted to throw that in there. People forget about that. So some fre frequently asked questions that I get, I wanted to hit is the schedule. We run four 10 hour shifts and then you have three days off. Now, this is gonna probably confuse some of you, but how we choose shifts and divisions and all that, we basically wipe the slate clean. We have a shift pick in October timeframe of every year for patrol. This is only for patrol. How we do that is we literally have an Excel spreadsheet that has the different divisions and the number of spots in each division with each start time. <laughs> so we have start times that go, we have like the morning one is 5.30 a.m. We have like a 9 a.m. We have a 2 p.m., a 5 p.m. and a 9 p.m. start time. So there's a bunch of different start times. Again, they're 10 hour shifts and we have four divisions. Now, when we call you for that um, shift pick, you get to pull up that shared document. You look what other people in front of you have picked and you go down and you can see what's open. You tell them, oh, I'll take um, Stetson Hills division at 9 a.m. And usually I'll have the days off for that first quarter um, with those slots. And you'll say, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday's off and they'll give you that slot. Now, after you've picked that, um, usually a couple of weeks, your whole division and start time will get together and you'll pick the second, third and fourth quarter days off. Um, so you could, and it's all based on seniority. It goes from top to the bottom and you pick, and then it goes back to the top to the bottom and then you pick. So you get to pick um, based on your seniority. So even if you're the last in seniority, you could still get uh, a, you know, a couple good sets of days off because um, it's kind of spread pretty evenly. So with all that being said, your start time is going to stay the same a whole year. Your division is going to stay the same the whole year. The only thing that may change is your days off. And that could change four times a year if you choose four different days off. If you choose the same days off all year, it's, everything will stay the same. Obviously, that's department needs based. So if something happens and all midnight shifts somewhere, get sick or whatever, then they're going to look for people to, to transition. Usually they ask for people to transition to that shift. If they don't get enough, then it goes by seniority. Lowest seniority gets moved over to that shift. But that does not happen often, so don't freak out. Usually you're, you're the same shift, the same stuff all year. I know that was really quick and can be confusing if you've never done it before. Take-home cars. We do not have take-home cars unless you're in an on-call specialized unit. So most patrol, all that kind of stuff, you don't have a take home car, you leave them at the substations, you drive into the substation, go to lineup, check out your car, and then go into shift. There is no age maximum to become a police officer with us. Uh, you can, I literally don't have a number. I mean, we've had 55 year old, you know, retire out of the military and come over and work with us. Um, so there's no maximum age limit for us. Um, you must be 21 years a, of age by the date of hire. So that's kind of the minimum age limit we have. 
Uh, and that's just because in the state of Colorado, you have to be 21 to be a police officer. Military training, so I get this. If military training is awesome, like I said, we're we're in Colorado Springs. I mean, we're there's four bases within 15 minutes of us, so we're very um, we have a lot of military impact uh, within here on prior military. I'd say last time I checked, I think 40% of our department is prior military or current military reserves, something like that. So, um, but we can't give you like credit for, you know, if you were an MP or anything like that, just because it's military is a little bit different. We do give you the military preference points if you have your DD-214 by the time you apply. And that preference points goes to boost your entrance exam score. Waiting period. What I mean by this is if you applied this time or you applied last time, is there an amount of time you have to wait until you apply again? And uh, the answer is no. You can only apply once for each cycle. So if you applied, you know, today and you didn't make it, you can't apply in November. But if you didn't make it this time or something happens, you can apply the next process we have. So there's no waiting period for anything. Now, that does not take into account if there's something to do with like, you know, the marijuana and you have to wait those 18 months. You still have to make sure you get that 18 month time period in there. Ride alongs, again, we usually, uh, usually I'm really promoting ride alongs. Uh, it's a great way, no matter what department you're interested in, um, I would highly suggest doing it. Of course, COVID's hit, all that's changed. We are not conducting ride alongs right now it sucks but i mean it's for the safety of our officers to be honest um so i am not certain when that program will start up again i'm guessing it's probably not going to be until next year especially how the numbers are going right now but as soon as we can get that program up and running do a ride along if you can if you can it's just a great way again instead of having me talk to you and tell you how amazing everything is you get to go out and you get to see you get to work with the officers um, so even if it's another agency you guys are interested in, there's one tip I can give you. It's to do a, a ride along with them. Uh, I kind of hit a little bit about laterals. Um, if there's any other questions about that, I'm gonna we could talk later about it. So I'm going to leave this up for a minute here, just in case somebody needs my contact email. Everybody should have it. And I am going to try to go over here. I'm going to start at the bottom. No, I'm going to start at the top because I'll miss somebody of this chat here. How are post-certified in individuals tested? Um, so if you are post-certified already, you still go through the entire academy um, like everybody else. But usually, and I say usually because it's, it's determined by the commander in charge of the academy for that time but usually we do not make you take the post test at the end of the academy so while everybody else is taking the test you don't have to they have made people do that before take the test um, that's been a while but they did it because it was part of their like score and ranking and all that while they were in the academy again they have not done that in a while i don't foresee that that'll happen again so more than likely, you're going to go through the academy and you're not going to need to recertify with post or take that test with post. Uh, how many reps for the bench press? It is one time. You need to do one rep of 60% of your body weight. You can do as many as you want to get up there. <laughs> Obviously, there's probably, um, you know, some strategy to not do that, <laughs> you know, you kind of want to get close, but again, you want to warm up, don't hurt yourself. Um, but we try to again, let you warm up and do all that stuff, but you only need to do one rep. And again, all that is on our webpage and we have a video on it. Alternative education question here. Yeah, we don't need that letter from CSU Global until you move into the background. At that time, that's when we start really looking and getting to know you and we'll contact you and make sure that you're in the program, that you actually have you know, a plan to get those 30 credits, all that kind of stuff. So that's something we do um, kind of in the background stages stuff. Just make sure you have your plan on how you're gonna to get to that 30. Um, you can contact CSU Global, they'll help you with that. 
if you want to go to a different college university, you can, but CSU Global is the one that does that 30. So if you're at 55 and you want to take a couple more classes to get to the 60 and not worry about that, as long as you get those classes and you're done with the schooling prior to the start date of the academy, you're good to go. Oh, great question. Um, is there a living distance requirement um, while in the academy or while employed? That's a wonderful question. And the answer is no, there isn't. You can live wherever you want <laughs> and drive five hours if you want to get to work. Uh, you do not need to live within a specific distance of Colorado Springs um, to be an officer here. Now, there are times when you do, if you're on a, in an on-call unit, you have to be able to respond usually within a certain amount of time. So. But if you're if you're not in that unit, then it doesn't matter. You can live wherever. You don't have to live within the city limits. So what kind of benefits can you opt out of? You don't need to, I don't think you have to do any benefits. So you can opt out of just about everything, especially I know like retired military, some of that, they don't really need anything. Uh, another good question, how many positions we are actually looking um, for 70 is what I'm planning for right now. We're gonna be hiring 70 for that academy in August, September of next year. Uh, again, uh, that can change. A lot is up in the air because of the COVID stuff, but uh, I'm pretty sure we're gonna be right around that. It'll be 50 to 70. Another great, great question. How many years on patrol um, before you can move to specialized units? Uh, it depends on the unit, depends on how much experience the person in charge of that unit wants you to have. But for the most part, it's three to five years. Most of the time, it's that P1, police officer first class. And sometimes it's what we call P1 plus one. So it's a police officer first class plus one year experience. Again, that's not all the time. There's been officers that have been on for three years and gone into a specialized unit. Again, if it's something like SWAT, K9, something like that, it may be a little longer because it's more competitive. But again, it's up to the individual and how they set themselves up for success. So that's kind of a hard question to answer. Uh, I will say that one of the greatest benefits of our department and being a police officer with a lot of these departments is being able to, to go into different units. Um, you can be, you know, patrol, which is a great job. And then you can go and do a major accident unit or canine or SWAT. And we have full time in all those. Um, we're a big agency, so we have, I don't even know how many SWAT officers we have now. I mean, it's like over 20 now. We have like 18 full-time canine dogs right now um, that go home with their handlers. And uh, we have a full-time regional bomb squad. We have drone pilots. We have a lot of different stuff. So there's a lot of things you can do throughout your career here, which is pretty cool. And it's kind of an internal process. We post the job on a job board and then you apply and some of them will have a physical test. Some of them will just be an interview. Some of them might have a scenario, but it kind of depends on what it is. Uh, so this question is asking basically when we're going to let you know if you've made it into the academy. We try to, again, give you two months prior to the start date. Um, and you can attend the academy if you're on military leave. So if you, let's just say uh, you don't get out of the military until November and um, the academy starts in September, October, and you have three months of military leave, you can still attend our academy, but you must be able to attend it full time. Um, so that's kind of one of the only things we we stipulate with that. Uh, it's a great question. If you forgot something or couldn't remember something, no worries. Yeah, don't worry about it in the application process. When we go into that background process, that's really where we're going to start um, digging in and figuring out who you are. So <clears throat> I appreciate your honesty, though. So time frame, um, like I said, that once you submit your application, um, you should receive an answer within 24 to 48 hours on whether or not your application was accepted, and that's working days. Then we are going to do the written test in the end of November, beginning of December. If not earlier, if I can't get it going earlier, um, that written test should be uh, like you'd almost immediately get your scores back. But I, I tell you 24 to 48 again, um, just to make sure um, you'll get your scores pretty much really quickly after you, you submit that test so you'll know whether or not you're moving on. If you get a 70 or higher in that test, we send you an email on how to complete the, um, the interview portion, the, the recorded 
portion of it. Um, <clears throat> usually we give you a week to do that. So those are all right in a row. Then after you do that interview, the spark hire interview, there's gonna be a couple months where we have to process all those interviews. Um, and then, like I said, in March is when we're gonna start doing the backgrounds. Uh, and then as far as the final offers, again, we try to give you two months notice. Um, so that's gonna be June, July timeframe. Do training certificates count at the academy? No, they do not. We don't accept any certificates from anywhere to count towards the academy. We put everybody through, uh, even the ones, like I said, who's gone through post already, you still go through our entire academy. And it's it's just because we want everybody on the same page. We feel we're paying you really well to go through the academy. We're not a military style academy. We're an adult based learning environment. It's like going to school. Um, you go there during the day, go home at night. Um, obviously, it's a little little more stress, um, <clears throat> and we still, you know, you still say yes, sir, and no, ma'am, and that kind of stuff. But it is um, not quite um, like how some of the academies are, what we call the the military style academy, where we're trying to get you to fail anything like that. So, be that what it may, is why we require everybody to go through the academy. I had a speeding ticket in 2019. And the state that I got it in lost my payment. Great. So this is a perfect example. Uh, and just in case somebody can't read this question, it says uh, they had a speeding ticket. Um, they lost the payment and they suspended the license, but then they reinstated it because it was on it was their fault, whatever state that was. So um, that's a perfect example that while you're going through the application, um, you might have to say, yes, my license was suspended. Um, and then you're you're just going to expect it. I know it sucks, but it rejects your application. And then you write us and say exactly this. This is what happened. Um, and then we're going to move it on. And I can say with pretty much certainty that you'd be moved on and your application would be accepted because that stuff does happen. <clears throat> so don't let that that keep you from applying and don't freak out if you get um, quote unquote disqualified at first. Again, take the time to write us um, and we'll we'll fix it for you. Uh, I think I kind of hit this with the training certificates. We don't take anything. We put everybody through. Um, even as we we're talking about laterals who've been an uh, an officer with other places, we still put everybody through. Now um, if you're talking about like you were a driving instructor or that kind of stuff, um, that is kind of up to Colorado Post. Now, if it's within the state uh, of Colorado, let's say you were, you know, in Woodland Park or something, you were a driving instructor out there, you still can be a driving instructor with us um, because that's a state certified uh, instructor course. Um, if you um, if you are in another state, um, you can work with Post and transitioning that over. Um, a lot of times, to be honest, it's just easier to go back through the course. We pay you, you're getting paid, like we'll just say a driving instructor, you're getting paid good money. Um, and instead of being on patrol that you know week or two, you're out driving cars around. So um, a lot of people just go and, and redo the training. But if there's something you're really into, yes, we do work to get that, or you have to work to get that transitioned over um, to this state. Yes, if you, so this question is, I have a bachelor's degree from a foreign country, they have an equivalency, um, recognized organization in the US, does it count as education requirements? Uh, yes, it does, as long as we have that equivalency, it does indeed. We, I, was, I keep forgetting to read these questions for you guys. Do you, do you all have operations that work out of headquarters? Um, or do you have substations? So we have substations. We have four substations. Uh, we call them, well, they're substations, but they're within each division. So there's really four divisions. Um, and if you look at Colorado Springs, it's literally like split down the middle and e in each way, both horizontally and vertically. Um, so you report to whatever substation you had signed up for that year before. So when I was using the example of Sand Creek, that's our Southeast substation. Um, so that's where you show up. That's where you're going to work out of that quadrant every year. Um, each division is further broken down into sectors. Um, and so when you go to work, a lot of times you're assigned a certain sector within that division. 
Um, but yeah, you stay within your division. Now, of course, if something crazy happens in a different division and they need help, you're going to be crossing lines and going into that division to help out. But um, you start and you end your shift in the same division um, every day. Great question. Uh, if we want to work overtime, are there opportunities for us to do so? Yes, we have an entire um, what we call extra duty program. Um, so that's a different pay. That's not necessarily overtime, but you can do it on your off time. Um, and it's, I want to say that it's like $32 an hour right now. Um, what that is, is like, a, like we have a big church here that needs officers to direct traffic when they're getting out. Um, and so they'll contact our overtime um, advisor and they'll make a schedule and then you sign up if you want to go do it on your off time. And again, that's, it's not time and a half. It's at a certain amount of pay. Um, <clears throat> then if you're working, if you're on shift and something happens every Again, we're hourly, so if you have three hours of overtime because something crazy happened, you're working a crazy case, that's all time and a half. Um, and that happens, I mean, that can happen frequently depending on what shift and what division you're working. Um, we do also have some overtime you can sign up with. Now, that's usually based if it's a city event. Um, most city events um, are at a time and a half basis um, and then we send out an email saying hey there's an event we need extra officers for like we have um, we have a lot of big events here in Colorado Springs so like a balloon glow and some crazy things where we'll set you know block roads and all that and it's a big event um, and you can get time and a half for that so you really you can work as much as you want to I mean you can work a lot if somebody calls in sick, a lot of times they'll send out a message saying, hey, uh, we need somebody to work Stetson Hills swing shift today, um, and you can sign up for it or throw your name in the hat to go do it. So there's quite a bit of work. You'll never run out of work, I guarantee it. Uh, are new officers assigned to a specific division based on performance abilities or class ranking when they graduate? Um, again, that kind of depends. Most of the time what we do is we try to to um, put you with a training officer that's going to work well with you um, and help you get help you gr get out of that PTO program, um, and so it's whatever shift that PTO and um, division, what, whatever that PTO works. Um, so we do try to match you with somebody that you're going to work well with. Um, <clears throat> so you do not most of the time get a pick where you're going to go we assign you and we pick where you go and again we the first half of your pto is going to be with somebody different and then we switch you and we switch your shifts over the second half the reason is there's different calls you're going to get during the day than you know at you know uh 12 o'clock you know a.m and 12 o'clock p.m you're going to get totally different calls so we want to subject you to all those different things and help you prepare for what it's really like no matter what shift you end up working then after you, just so I'm clear, so after you graduate your PTO program, um, it is kind of based on where is needed for the rest of that year until that shift pick. Um, and then usually what we do is we block out certain times and places um, within the um, patrol like sectors and divisions because we can't have like, you know, 15 new people working um, Sand Creek Midnights and, and, you know, we have to kind of spread you out because we want you to get that experience and we need you working with experienced officers. So we do block out times and you still do a shift pick and it's based off of your um, seniority within your class and you pit and you go through and you can pick like, oh, I see there's a, a day shift at Stetson Hills. I'll take that. Um, and then the next year after that, you're in the pool with everybody else. Uh, good question. During a patrol, do your during patrol, excuse me, do your officers ride in two in a car or separately? We do separately. You have your own car, you're by yourself for the most part. Um, when we have two officers in a car, we call that a baker unit. And usually they're doing a specialized detail. Um, so 99.9% .9 of the time you will be by yourself in a car. It doesn't mean that you're going to calls by yourself, though. You just have two separate cars. Um, so like for example, domestic disturbance. Um, in our policies, we have to send at least two cars to every domestic disturbance. So you'll be there with another partner. Um, you just might show up a little bit, like not at the same time. So that's up to you to make sure you're safe before you make contact. Um, 
but again, you'll have two, two people showing up, just those be in their own cars. Um, and the reason is, is because we feel it makes, um, it allows you more freedom. So if uh, somebody needs to go do something else, they're not tied to that patrol car. Um, so you can still be safe, still have two officers going to calls, but they have their own modes of transportation if needed. Is there a pay bonus for speaking a second language? There is not. Um, it is always something we look for, um, and that would be more like something you'd put in your resume um, that would help you uh, be more, um, be something we'd look at as far as some, a desirable trait. That's a good way of putting it. Um, so that's something like in your background and that kind of stuff that's going to, like we're going to look at. Um, but there is no pay incentive for uh, a second language. Uh, no, you do not need to buy a gun. Uh, we give you the MMP 2.09 millimeter. Um, and then we give you the weapon mounted light as well. And you'll get that in the academy uh, when you go through the range. Um, so no, you, and we give you all ammo. Like I said, you literally are going to spend, you could probably spend nothing besides, like I said, your boots um, if you really want to. But most people, again, buy a couple extra pairs of cuffs and you know, maybe an extra better uh, handcuff key, you know, those kind of things. So you, that's why I say under 200 bucks, you're probably going to spend 200 bucks just kind of getting fun things um, that you like or that you see while you're in the academy that you want to get. Um, you can buy an ox gun or a off-duty gun. Um, <clears throat> so what I mean by an auxiliary gun uh, is most officers carry two guns while they're on duty. They'll have their uh, MMP nine millimeter on the side that you see, excuse me. And then they'll have a, like a small revolver um, somewhere hidden on them, like on their ankle or, you know, on their vest somewhere, just in case um, their gun doesn't work. And that's what we call an auxiliary gun. Um, that is on you to buy. We do not provide that. <clears throat> um, so if you want one of those, obviously that's going to be expense an expense. Um, and then if you have a different off-duty gun you want to carry, so maybe like like I had a, a Smith & Wesson Model 60 357 I carried for for a few years under my, my left arm as an auxiliary gun. <clears throat> and then when I was off-duty, I didn't want to carry my, my huge Smith & Wesson 2.0 around. Um, so I uh, like right now I have a, a SIG 365. Um, so that's what I carry off-duty. Uh, yeah, okay, so... Uh, the question is, is um, do you change at work or do you change at home as far as into your uniform? Um, we actually require you to change at work um, because we have to pay you legally um, to put on that stuff. So you could come like in your work pants and like a black shirt, but you can't put on your uh, ballistics vest, uh, any of that stuff until you're at work. So we have to pay you for it. Um, so most of the time, depending on what shift I work, of course, but like, like if I was working at swings or a power shift, um, you know, I'd do things before. So I'd have just my civilian clothes, jeans, all that. Um, we have locker rooms. So when I'd come to work, uh, you kind of have to check in right at your start time. So if your start time was 2 p.m., you kind of check in and then you'd go into the locker room, <clears throat> change into your uniform and come back. You'd have lineup and then check out your cars and all that kind of stuff. So you're getting paid to do all that. All right. Anybody else have anything else? And if somebody wants to unmute, if I haven't like made it to where you can't, you're more than welcome to ask me a question. <clears throat> 